today this house mourns the passing of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the founding Prime Minister of Singapore. As you have said, Madam Speaker, Mr. Lee was our longest serving and most illustrious member. When Mr. Lee was admitted to SGH a few weeks ago for pneumonia, Singaporeans from all walks of life watched anxiously, increasingly worried as his condition worsened. There were well wishes, little cards placed all over SGH, so much so that SGH had to create a special site in their quad. We saw elderly Singaporeans with arthritic joints, nailing, prostrated themselves for his recovery. Despite the outpouring of deep wishes and fervent prayers, it was not to be. Mr. Lee's chair sits empty today. His loss is deeply felt. A nation cries out in mourning. No one moved Singapore as Mr. Lee Kuan Yew did. Not in life, not in sickness, and not in death. We in this house, together with all Singaporeans here and abroad, weep that Mr. Lee is no longer among us. Why this deep sorrow for one man? Why do tears flow uncontrollably for thousands on his passing and memory? Simply put, Singapore would not be what it is today without Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. He was that bright night star that guided us an impoverished and fearful nation through independence. He envisioned, then drove Singapore to become a success story as he promised from mud flats to a thriving metropolis that countries all over seek to emulate. Today, Singaporeans hold their passports with confidence and pride. Mr. Lee's vision and tenacity rallied and energized the nation to overcome seemingly insurmountable odds. He coaxed, pushed Singaporeans to do what was difficult, but ultimately right and good for their long-term interests. With his powers of persuasion, Mr. Lee's clarity and confidence became ours, the people's, the mark of a great leader. Mr. Lee is no longer with us, but I believe, as many do here, that each generation will discover anew his wisdom in building the sturdy foundations of a thriving Singapore. His life is like a treasure chest. Each visit, through his many deeds and words, and you see it now in the community tribute sites, the videos that played, the people who sit there riveted by what he said, how he said it, his convictions, the courage of his convictions, his clarity, what he believed in, what he saw as problems. And as you replay it, you reveal pearls of wisdom, nuggets of sound advice, as I found for this eulogy. For such a monumental life, any eulogy will fall short, and I seek your pardon. But to honor his memory and remind us what he stood for, I propose to capture the essence of Mr. Lee through his speeches, the very words he used in this parliament. Even at the dawn of his political career, Mr. Lee identified closely with the hopes and aspirations of common Singaporeans. Madam Speaker, you mentioned his first election in 1955. There, he told the voters of Tanjung Paga that out of 25 divisions, he wanted to, quote, represent workers, wage earners, and small traders, not wealthy merchants or landlords. That is why he chose Tanjung Paga, not Tangling. The residents of Tanjung Paga believed and trusted him and elected him by a handsome margin. Astonishingly, as the Madam Speaker has said, Mr. Lee would be returned as the MP for 13 subsequent general elections. He would serve as MP for Tanjung Paga for 60 years, from 1955 to 2015. In fact, he's the only MP that Tanjung Paga has ever had since elections were started in Singapore, predating our independence. I doubt this record will ever be broken in our parliamentary history. But Mr. Lee and his government did not get re-elected time and time again because they dispensed sweet words. Indeed, Mr. Lee would often warn against 
politicians with silver tongues purveying sweet promises, empty promises. He gained a fearsome reputation as one who eschewed the easier, more popular, but ultimately wrong paths, as he recounted in his book, Hard Truths. Flattery fell flat on him, as did lofty but pretentious ideals. For Mr. Lee, the asset test was whether the idea or proposal would make Singapore stronger. If it weakened this country's foundations, he would reject it. Even if it was politically incorrect to say so and attracted widespread criticism. If it would make Singapore better, then no obstacles, no preconceived notions, no preset habits were too deeply entrenched to uproot or overcome. Indeed, he will attack these hindrances squarely and vigorously to improve our circumstances. That was the Lee Kuan Yew the world knew and respected throughout his political life. In 1968, an MP asked this in Parliament how the British withdrawal could impact Singapore. Mr. Lee told Singaporeans matter-of-factly that the British bases made up 20% of the GNP and tens of thousands of jobs would be lost. He spoke plainly. There was more to come. He told Singaporeans, quote, that they would have to adapt and adjust without any whimpering or wringing of hands as a way of life which they have been accustomed to over 30 years comes to an end. A truly hard truth. When another MP followed and asked if economic aid from the British could ease the effects of the pullout, Mr. Lee's quick and unequivocal rejoinder was that any aid should, quote, not make us dependent on perpetual injections of aid from the outside, that we cannot change our attitude to life that the world does not owe us a living, this was the origin of the phrase, that the world does not owe us a living and that we cannot live by the begging bowl. The best way of meeting the problem is to go about it quietly and intelligently, discussing our problems in a low key and with as little fuss and bother as possible. Unquote. These were his words in 1971 and the British were pulling out. There was steel in the tone of these replies. But Mr. Lee revealed later in 1999 that he knew how serious the problem really was. He said, 1968 to 1971 were critical years for our young republic. We knew we either made it or we would fail. We worked hard, we worked smart, and more important, we worked as a team. By the time the British withdrew in October 1971, we had avoided massive unemployment. Mr. Lee said, with as little fuss as possible, but in those critical years, it would mean a fundamental overhaul of what Singaporeans had indeed become accustomed to but could not afford. To stop the rot, Mr. Lee rooted out corruption, attacked the malaise that afflicted our society and economy. What followed would remake the work environment, industrial relations, schools, skills upgrading, productivity, defense and security the very issues we talk about in Parliament today, but in a much more parlous state. He rid Singapore of unsavory, unproductive, and unsustainable habits and customs inherited from its past. A slew of legislative reforms followed in this House. Amendments were made to the Employment Industrial Relations, the Trade Unions Act, that put an end to disruptive labor strikes. Bills were passed to build technical training institutes, the forerunners of today's ITE, polytechnics and universities, to educate and upgrade the skills of our workforce. Work hours were extended and the number of public holidays slashed. As you can imagine, none of these bills was popular, not one. All of us in government and as MPs on the ground know how difficult it is to carry unpopular policies, even when they are right. Why did Mr. Lee and his government choose to persuade Singaporeans to do again and again what was necessary but painful? Mr. Lee himself provided us the answer. He said in 1968 in this house, quote, if we were a soft community, then the temptation would be to leave things alone and hope for the best. Then only good fortune can save us from the unpleasantness which reason and logic tell us is ahead of us. But we are not an easy-going people. 
We cannot help thinking, calculating, and planning for tomorrow, for next week, for the next month, for the next year, for the next generation. And it is because we have restless minds, forever probing and testing, seeking new and better solutions to old and new problems that we have never been, and I trust never shall be, tried and found wanting." Unquote. Mr. Lee spoke these words in 1968 to remind Singaporeans that unless they were willing to change and continuously adapt, even if it meant short-term gain, Singapore could not rise. In return for the people's trust and willingness to do what was needed, Mr. Lee and his government promised a better Singapore after these reforms. To quote, more industries, more jobs, improved standards of education, health services, social amenities, and housing for all. Again, the issues we talk about in our parliaments today. But as prescient as these words were, it seemed, it seemed an unattainable dream when Mr. Lee gave these promises in 1968. Singapore's per, per capita GDP then was around Myanmar today. It would take a further two decades of constant effort and continuous change, seeking new and better solutions, as he put it, which included CPF reforms and the introduction of national service in 1967. But at the end of it, Mr. Lee and his government delivered. Cabinet colleagues remember Mr. Lee, our mentor, often reminding us to under-promise and over-deliver. Say less and do more. What you promise, you must deliver and more. Mr. Lee walked his talk. Even in his twilight years, Mr. Lee kept a constant watch over Singapore's future in the world. Singapore's well-being was his obsession, as many of us know. War betied anyone who tried to knock it down. He was never complacent about our fundamentals, and his singular passion was to make sure that Singapore remained well-positioned for the future. In 2009, Mr. Lee, then at 86 years, unexpectedly joined a debate on the motion about equality in this house. He said, quote, Sir, I had not intended to intervene in any debate, but I was doing my physiotherapy just now and reading the newspapers, and I thought I should bring the house back to earth and remind everybody what is our starting point, what is our base, and if we do not recognize where we started from and that these are our foundations, we will fail. 86-year-old gentleman doing his physiotherapy, reading the newspapers, Lesser mortals would have thought of other things, but Mr. Lee says, I have to make a speech in Parliament. Mr. Lee went on to explain why the Constitution of Singapore enjoins us, the government, to specifically look after the position of the Malays and other minorities. Our Constitution states expressly that it is the duty of the government not to treat everybody as equal. He quote, as he said, it is not a reality, it is not practical, it will lead to grave and irreparable damage if we work on that principle. Lee Kuan Yew refused to be swayed by ideology that could not work. He considered these as, quote, highfalutin ideals that misled Singaporeans. As a result, today, many countries come to Singapore to study how we have maintained our harmony in a multiracial society. But while Mr. Lee held constant and firm to key fundamentals, he could change his own mind if it made Singapore better. In 2005, he supported a proposal to build integrated resorts. He told his house why. Quote, the old model on which I worked was to create a first world city in a third world region, clean, green, efficient, pleasant, healthy, and wholesome, safe and secure for everyone. These virtues are valuable, but no longer sufficient. Singapore has to reposition itself in this world if you are in charge, if you are responsible for Singapore's future, for its well-being, for its vibrancy, for the kind of life Singapore can provide its people in 10, 20 years, can you say no? That is the question you have to answer. This is your choice. Surely we must move forward and keep abreast of the top cities in Asia and the world." Unquote. Above all, Mr. Lee believed that ultimately it was the quality of its people and leaders that determined a nation's chances of success. <clears throat> Madam Speaker has quoted what he said when Parliament moved in 1999. Mr. Lee never believed in the size of this chamber and its grandeur. He believed that the understatement 
lies great strengths of character, integrity, and determination. And that is what will see us through. Mr. Lee never believed that physical monuments or towering edifices engendered or sustained greatness. He would brush aside these as foundations for our success. This past week, we have seen the glowing tributes to Mr. Lee from leaders and on the front pages of newspapers from all over the world. Ministers and MPs from Australia and New Zealand have held special sessions in their parliaments in Mr. Lee's honour. World leaders are disrupting their schedules to come personally to attend his funeral service. This recognition is seldom given to even leaders of great countries, let alone a little red dot. I find it befitting and poetic that for one who did not believe in monuments, that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew himself became great, Singapore's greatest icon. Indeed, Mr. Lee has had such a monumental impact on all Singaporeans that each would have his or her own special memory of him. I'm sure all of us have one particular memory or particular memories with Mr. Lee. You read the tributes, the artworks, the banners, the beautifully crafted posters that tens of thousands of Singaporeans have laid at the tribute sites. Many others will certainly remember him as an internationally renowned great teacher and statesman. For myself, two personal encounters have left lasting impressions. In 2009, Mr. Lee led a delegation on an official trip to many states of Malaysia. Deputy Prime Minister Tharman and I were part of it. The delegation was having dinner together. It was a long trip. When Mr. Lee asked to excuse himself so that he could speak on the phone to Mrs. Lee. Due to previous strokes, Mrs. Lee could not speak, but remained conscious and aware. <coughs> Mr. Lee had made it a routine to speak and read to her each night. He did not want to break this routine, even though he was in Malaysia on a long trip. He asked the nurse to, phone, to put the phone to Mrs. Lee and spoke to her. <coughs> he did this every night while we were in Malaysia. We stood aside to respect their privacy. But that image of Mr. Lee hunched over the phone speaking to Mrs. Lee, who could not speak back, will stay with me for a very long time as a simple but pure picture of true devotion. Mrs. Lee passed away in 2010, and the impact on him was visible physically. I think many people noticed this. Mr. Lee indeed had become frail as he approached his 90th birthday in 2013. He had problems in swallowing, food would go down the wrong way in his, into his windpipe, infecting his lungs repeatedly. As eating could cause aspiration pneumonia, he needed intravenous nutrition as supplement, but became progressively thinner. Parliament was sitting that year on September 16, his birthday, and we wanted to acknowledge his 90th birthday, an auspicious birthday. I called him Mr. Lee at the Istana and told him about our plans. He said he would be in Parliament that day on September 16. Unfortunately, when the day came, a dehydrated and weakened Mr. Lee had to go to hospital and be put on drip. His doctors advised him not to attend Parliament. We were informed, so we called off our plans. But just before Parliament adjourned, we were surprised when Mr. Lee entered the chamber. I found out later that he had overruled his doctors, saying that he must attend Parliament because he had given his commitment. He wanted to walk, actually, but thankfully, his doctors persuaded him that it would be acceptable for a 90-year-old man on intravenous nutrition to be wheeled into the chamber. That September 16, this house had the last privilege to wish him happy birthday together. After Parliament adjourned, he stayed on as we cut his birthday cake, sang him a birthday song. At age 90, frail and dehydrated, Mr. Lee kept his word to be here. Great strength of character, determination, and integrity. Lee Kuan Yew had all of these qualities and more. He kept his promises. What he said he would do, he would and more. 
whether it was for individuals or an entire nation. As we honor his memory, we resolve to learn from his example to be men and women, individually and collectively as a nation, to have their great strength of character, integrity, and determination. These values, as Mr. Lee emphasized, would see us through difficult times. We must maintain, as he put it, restless minds, forever probing and testing, seeking new and better solutions to old and new problems, so that we have never been, and I trust never shall be, tried and found wanting. We must aspire to these qualities that Mr. Lee asked of us, because that would be the greatest tribute to the memory of Lee Kuan Yew, of what he stood for, fought against, and desired for the good of Singapore and Singaporeans. There will not be another Lee Kuan Yew who made us better than we are or could be. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew founded, moved, and lifted a nation because of his unwavering devotion and a life poured out for Singapore he has made all our lives better for many generations to come. Few mortals have accomplished so much in their lifetime. We in this house are honored to have lived and served with him. His legacy will live on through us and through this nation. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had his critics while alive. He was asked on a number of occasions how he thought history would judge him, all at the end. His reply would invariably be non-committal. Once he replied factually, I'd be dead by then. That was Mr. Lee. But today we have the opportunity to tell Mr. Lee, if he could hear us, and I believe he can. Mr. Lee, we would like to tell you that Singaporeans have decided. Thousands upon thousands have lined the streets on your journey from Sri Tamasik to this parliament house. They queued for hours under the hot sun to pay their respects here. They did so spontaneously, an outpouring of gratitude and admiration for what you have done for their lives. I believe thousands more will do so when you move from here to your final resting place on Sunday. Singaporeans shouted your name repeatedly and clapped with adulation. Mr. Lee, I'm sorry that they had to wait so long. I can just hear his reprimand in my ear. My cabinet colleagues walked through the crowds thanking our people for their patience. Singaporeans smiled, replied that the wait was little compared to what you had done for them. Employers let off workers who skipped meals to pay respects. Volunteers distributed food and drink to people in line. Parents brought their little children along, determined that their children should know who had been responsible for our good lives here. Senior citizens hobbled on walking sticks or on wheelchairs to say goodbye and thank you personally, despite their physical infirmities. Mr. Lee, all these Singaporeans, young and old, whose lives you have touched, it is they who matter, as you've always said, and who have pronounced the final judgment on your life's work. It is a great work that has surpassed all expectations. It is called Singapore, and filled with Singaporeans who love and revere you. Majula Singapura, rest in peace.